Hello everyone, we're back again with another critique video. Today on the channel, we have Paul Saladino again. Yes, again. I said this in the last video that I did, which was a Patreon exclusive, precisely because I've done so many videos on Paul that I decided, well, you know, I want to give the public and new viewers a break. I'm not trying to make this a Paul Saladino hate channel. I really mean that. But if he wants to stop being featured on the channel, and if other people would like him to stop being featured on the channel, then he would just stop talking, because every single thing that he says is wrong, basically. Even if some of the conclusions he arrives at are correct, he does all of his math wrong to get there, so effectively he really still doesn't know what he's talking about, okay? Anyway, this video is entitled Controversial Thoughts, Acid Alkaline Balance on an Animal-Based Diet. The last video I did on Paul Saladino, once again, is a Patreon exclusive, and that was released two weeks ago. And it was also on acid-based balance, but it was whenever he was a strict carnivore four years ago or five years ago. Ever since then, he has sort of changed his stance because of the fact that he's introduced fruit and honey. And so he's going to say some different things, I suspect, in this video, which is why I'm doing another video on it. This video is from two years ago, after he heavily introduced fruit and honey into his diet and started his whole fundamental health podcast and sells the ancestral supplements or whatever. That's not his brand. It's the heart and soil supplements. But either way, we're just going to go directly into this. First, just like always, please subscribe to the Patreon if you haven't already to gain access to one week early uploads, ad-free content, uncensored content, and one extra video per week. And also, if you haven't bought my book Contraindicated already, I would recommend doing that as well. A second edition is coming very, very soon. That being next year, to be fair. It's whenever my current edition has been out for a year. The second edition of my book is going to be a thousand times better. That's because it's in my control. And I am the one editing and formatting that book completely independently. And I am also publishing it independently. So, with that being said, let's just jump into this video right now and see what he has to say. It's a long video. We might not get through the whole thing. I'm going to try to, but we might not actually need to because it might be a waste of time. So, let's see what you have to say, Paul. What is up, you guys? Welcome to another edition of Controversial Thoughts. This is my weekly soliloquy. It's my le weekly, my weekly, it's my weekly opportunity to do a little monologuing about something that I find interesting or relevant. Last week's Controversial Thoughts episode was about kids and what diet might be ideal for kids. Is an animal-based diet appropriate for kids? And the short answer there, in my opinion, was clearly yes. I believe that an animal-based diet based on organs, meat. First thing, or first problem there, based on organs. So you think it should be based on organs. That's the first thing you said. You didn't say that that should be the foundation of it, but at this point of recording, actually, whenever you record this video, that seemed to be your implications there. Organs, meat, and then you're going to say fruit and honey. There is no requirement for carbohydrates in the human diet and neither should they be consumed in any degree whatsoever if one can actually manage to get their carbohydrate intake down to zero if their physiology functions that way and optimally at that. Okay, so whatever. I'm going to try not to focus on carbohydrates that much in this video because that's not what this video is about. So if you hear him say things that you would object to and you would expect me to object to and I don't object to them, that's why. It's not because I don't object to them. It's because we're trying to get to the meat and potatoes, but not potatoes, of this video. Things like honey uh, is quite appropriate. Evolution. No. Early. Clinic. No. No. Logically. No. <laughs> for children. Paul. No. Um, with so many precedents and so many examples of kids self-selecting those foods during that. Oh, so if you self-select a food, then therefore, it, it, wow. Virtual thoughts video. I reviewed an article about an experiment that was done in the 1930s uh, by a physician looking at kids. Was it an experiment? Was there complete control exerted? Self-selecting diets. And these were children between the ages of six and 11 months. And one of the interesting things that I came across in that article that I mentioned on the controversial thoughts was that in this study, um, all of the kids selected at least a balance of what they considered to be alkaline and acidic foods during the self-selection process. And so you think the palate of these children was selecting the foods because it sensed the acidity and alkalinity of the foods in order to balance the pH of the bodily fluids? You know, Paul, I would recommend you read this textbook here, the Stewart's textbook of acid base, and you study this and you learn acid base. Have I read this whole thing? No, but I'm in the middle of it. And guess what? It's consistent with every single thing that I've said on this channel about pH. Anyway, let's keep going. The majority of the kids actually had a moderate preponderance for potentially alkaline in the six month uh, period of ops. Well, that's a reach and that's, you know, a desperate observation, probably to fill in blanks on a piece of paper to get it published or something, because okay, this is ridiculous. That's not how selection works because you don't have to maintain your pH balance of your body by consuming foods that do such a thing. That's not how that works. pH is tightly regulated within the body at the level of the lungs and the kidneys of those children when they were self-selecting 
their diets. So I found this interesting and it reminded me of these discussions that I've had a little bit in the past. And I thought I might update my perspective on acid, alkaline elements. Yeah. Basically what you'll do is you'll update your perspective because it fits your addiction model. That's what you started doing. And what you did is you framed it as if it's because you're an open-minded magnanimous person and an objective person. When in reality, you will never change your mind again on anything. Now you can say that that's because you've actually found the answer and you're not going to be convinced otherwise because nothing will be as convincing as what you found. And that's a fair argument to make. You know what my opinion is? My opinion is that you'll never change it because, well, now you get to perpetuate your addiction to carbohydrates. Or diet. First thing I will say is that I've never seen any convincing evidence that an excessively alkaline diet is healthy for humans or that. I well, you're not going to find any evidence to suggest that a diet is healthy for humans in the area of human nutrition science, which is the field that you are observing right now in this video and that you always observe because there's no studies to inform upon that because that's a cause and effect claim. Health is the absence of disease process. So what you need to do in order to establish that something is healthy is to establish that one variable, that being the diet, one factor alone was causally associated with at least an amelioration in a disease process. But arguably you'd have to find a diet in general that was conducive to ameliorating all disease processes because that's what gets closer to health. You can't do that because that requires experimentation, Paul. You can't take two genetically identical twins, both phenotypically and genotypically identical, separate them at birth, put them into two separate metabolic ward lock-in rooms and observe them over their entire lives of attempting to infer lifelong health outcomes, 40 years for 40 year long health outcomes, etc. while controlling for every single variable, including the time they wake up, the time they go to bed, their stress levels, their hormone levels, the time they eat, etc. You can't do that. There are no experiments on human beings and there never will be. Too expensive, not ethical, and also extremely implausible for obvious reasons or that alkalized water is good for humans or it has no effect on physiology no really significant effects if you drink true 9.5 ph water which the machine that i use that's what it does what it will do is it will neutralize stomach acidity somewhat for a very transient ephemeral amount of time and it will have no effect on the body's ph that you can prevent cancer by eating an alkaline diet these are generally no, it's non science based claims that come from the realm of plant based rhetoric and. Yes, yes, correct. So, what are you going to say about this, Paul? Tales like this. Having said that, I did find it interesting that when children were self selecting diets, they tended to balance acid and alkaline elements. So what, Paul? There's no mechanism by which their selection methods could be based on the detection of acidity and alkalinity in the diet. I mean, fine, if you want to hypothesize this, go ahead. I think it's a little out there. And. I think it's worth asking whether we should do that in our own diets and where we No, what you're doing is you're desperately trying to find and, and basically scrounge up, just, just rummage through and find an argument to add to your ideology, to bolster it and to support it. That's what you're doing. We all know what you're doing has nothing to do with your actual belief that acidity and alkalinity with respect to diet needs to be balanced in order to maintain the pH balance of the body or something and the other bodily fluids like your interstitial fluids, blood plasma, all that nonsense. No find acidic versus alkaline foods. Now, another thing to note from the beginning is that the blood, the pH of your blood doesn't change based on what you eat. It's pretty tight. Oh, that's also not true. It does change. It just is maintained within a range of 6.9, actually. I've said 6.8. From what I've been reading, it seems to be 6.9. So what? 6.9 to 7.45 or so. Venous blood is more acidic, very slightly, 7.35, than blood plasma, which is around 7.4, 7.45. But yes, not significantly. Not at all. Because any ashes that are left over after you eat your food, which are just the ions left over after you eat your food, if in excess, are excreted through the the proximal convoluted tubules of the kidneys, I believe, through leaky junctions of the cells, which are a subtype of tight junctions that allow for the filtration of certain ions in and out of the solution, but not everything. Pretty interesting. Anyway, cool. Regulated between 7.35 and 7.45. If you don't know what pH is, it's a logarithmic scale of the concentration of a hydrogen ion. And uh, hydronium is how it exists in fluids, but fine, stoichiometrically, that's accurate, whatever. That is what a lot of biochemistry is based upon. What is the pH uh, of a given tissue? Yes, that is a lot of what biochemistry is based upon because enzymatic activity is actually predicated upon the concentration of H+, really, again, hydronium, in a solution. If you fall outside of that range that I just put forth, your enzymes will fail to function. Good. So you've gotten that good thus far. I'm just waiting for it to go off the deep end because it always does with Paul. And what is the concentration of acid 
or specifically the hydrogen ion in that tissue. And so well, there's your problem, okay? Because a hydrogen ion is not acid. An acid is a protonated ion. What do I mean by that? It, it, it means that it's an anion attached to a certain amount of hydrogen ions, positive ions. HCl is a perfect example, hydrochloric acid. That has no charge. That's an acid. If you take all of the water out of HCl and you hold it, it will not burn you. It will not do anything. That's an acid. You put that acid into an aqueous solution, such as a glass of water, it dissociates into H+, which then reacts with the water to form H3O+, hydronium ions, and whatever its respective anion is, in this case, chloride. The rate at which an acid will dissociate into the respective ions is called the acid dissociation constant, which isn't a constant because it changes depending on temperature and other things, the pressure of carbon dioxide gas being one of them, and that is represented as a Ka value or a pKa value, depending on what's easier for you to observe and assess. Okay, so that's, a, that's an acid. H plus is not an acid. It's an ion. It's important to realize that... Also, I should correct myself. H plus is not acidifying because that would imply that you can add H plus to a solution and acidify it, which isn't true because H plus is a dependent variable and is also the essence of pH, actually. The concentration of H plus is what determines the pH. It's what the pH is. Your blood is extremely tightly regulated in its pH. Um, now, yeah, well, that's interesting because in your last video, you pretended like it wasn't. So in your last video, I react to. So anyway, interesting. Your interstitial fluids, that is the, the fluid between your cells, may be a little bit more variable based on what you eat. And certainly your urine, which may be an indicator of your interstitial fluids. Okay, yes, your urine pH is supposed to vary, though, and that has no bearing on your health because it's just an amalgam of solutions in, in, into one solution, that being urine, it has no effect on the body. It builds up in the bladder, and then you excrete it later on. So who cares about that? I covered that in the other video I reacted to of yours as well. Varies significantly based on what you eat because excess acid or excess base, that is... No, not acids and not bases. Excess ions, anions, and cations. Colon. Uh, are excreted in your urine. And so you can take a urinary pH, which is a very easy, simple thing to do. You can buy urinary pH test strips on Amazon. Yeah, and you shouldn't do that because there's no reason to do it. Where you choose to buy your uh, goods and you can get a sense of your urinary pH. And I think urinary pH is an interesting thing for most of us to experiment with if we're into that sort of thing. Urinary pH- Why, Paul? If you're into it, I mean, just for fun, go ahead, I guess. It's a waste of money. You're not going to learn anything from it. But anyway, whatever, do what you want. But it, this, this is silly. It's stupid, I think. It's inane. Vary throughout the day. It will vary postprandially, that is, after eating. If you are waking up in the morning after a long fast, it may be a little bit lower, and it may rise a little bit throughout the day, depending on what you are eating. Now- well, that should be the end of your video. It's all that people need to understand. I will say here is that there's been an evolution in my thinking here a little bit. Many of you know my own story, starting out with a carnivore diet that was quite strict. Carnivore diet. You don't need to talk like that, Paul. Strict in the best sense of the word, I should say. It was very intentional. It was meat. It was organs. It was fat. And I did grow Organs was a problem. On it for about the first year. I've also done a recent controversial thoughts about my concern. Well, hold on. I thought it was two years. Long-term ketosis. Ultimately, I did run into issues myself with long-term ketosis, including- Well, that was your problem. Everyone will, because long-term ketosis isn't what you should do, okay? Who said to enter long-term ketosis and stay in it for months and months and years on end? It's not what you want. Cramping, heart palpitations related to recalcitrant, that is unsolvable electrolyte issues that I think occur in humans when the actions of insulin at the kidney are not present as happens in long-term ketogenic diets. Correct. It does. Well, not not long-term ketogenic diets, unless you're talking about one bereft of significant amounts and sufficient amounts rather of protein. Okay. Carnivore diet is replete with protein as long as you actually consume enough protein for your needs as a human being. Paul, you're extremely active regularly. And also not only were you not deriving sufficient protein, that was also intentional. You said that. You said you tried to be in deep ketosis regularly. That was your problem, Paul. This is not to say that I don't find value in ketogenic diets for certain conditions or in the short term, but I think that long-term ketosis and otherwise healthy humans is a recipe for uh, basically unfixable electrolyte issues. Well, so did you see what you did there? So first you, you started saying ketogenic diets and then you said long-term ketosis as if those are the same thing and they're not, Paul. A ketogenic diet is one bereft of carbohydrates and it is one that leaves you in ketosis most of the time. It is not a diet that leaves you in ketosis forever because that is a problem because ketosis is a catabolic state of the body and eventually catabolism turns into wasting away, okay? Cramps, palpitations, sleep disturbances, and hormonal imbalances. 
So yes, all of those things will happen on long-term ketosis. Great. We already covered this. Talk about that in probably two controversial thoughts podcasts ago. I will be the first person to say that I think a carnivore diet, an animal uh, exclusive diet of meat, organs, fat, et cetera, like I was eating is incredibly beneficial for many people. And I think that the things we learn from this should not be forgotten, which are that many people benefit from cutting out plant foods in their diet, whether it's GI issues, psychiatric issues, autoimmune issues in general. I think what we learn clearly from a nose to tail carnivore diet, that is a diet that includes both meat and organs, is that getting more of these very nutrient rich, very bioavailable nutrient full foods in your diet. Okay, bioavailability is important, but nutrient density is not as important as many people within the sphere like it to be or tout it to be. The absence of toxins is more important, I believe. You get sufficient nutritional content from meat, irrespective of the fact that it contains far less nutritional content as compared to other plant foods, for example. Bioavailability plays a role in why that is still sufficient, therefore, but, which is why I said it's more important than nutritional absolute value, but the the absence of toxins along with bioavailability is a recipe for flourishing, I believe, more than nutritional absolute content. So it's a huge benefit. And what I discovered was that adding some plant foods, the least toxic plant foods into my diet, back into my diet was another huge benefit. So, yeah, and the reason for that is because you were having a sufficient insulin response finally, and you were finally able to actually enter an anabolic state, which you weren't doing if you were in extended long-term ketosis. For some reason, you continue to obstinately and perversely now, okay, perversely at this point, say incessantly over and over and over again, almost so as to try and desperately convince yourself that you're still correct, despite all of the criticism that you've received, that a ketogenic diet is synonymous with long-term ketosis, and it's not. It's not. Amino acids, Paul, gluconeogenesis. Paul, what happens whenever you consume amino acids in a large bolus with a meal? Well, first, the amino acids are used to resynthesize bodily structures. That's protein's first primary use. Then what happens? Well, the rest of the amino acids that you consume are deaminated in the liver and then are used to produce glucose through gluconeogenesis. That's what happens, Paul. What does glucose do? That raises your insulin. Gluconeogenesis can and does become supply-driven if you consume enough protein, okay? It's a demand-driven process when you're not eating, not when you are and you eat sufficient protein, okay? Okay are the least toxic plant foods. I've talked about that many times in the past on previous podcasts. Based well, you also believe that the least toxic plant foods are the ones that contain the most fructose, which is the most deleterious and damaging sugar known to man. Okay, you conflate least toxic with the lowest concentration, not the absence of a concentration, the lowest concentration of anti-nutrients, which, I mean, that's your opinion, but I think it's ridiculous because you've also got fiber and you've got all the sugar that you can get in fruit and honey. Okay, there's, there's no fiber in honey, so I guess you could say that makes it a little better, but then you're just, <laughs> at that point, that's just bread and circuses too, because who cares? Well, this is actually slightly better because, well, they suck. So get rid of them. Okay. Uh, you can think about it from the perspective of a plant and realize that a plant has roots, stems, leaves, and seeds that it is trying to protect. And all of those are high. Okay. So can we get to acid base balance, Paul? You're six minutes into your video and it's, it has nothing to do with acid base. Those are all much more toxic parts of plants. In my opinion, it is the fruit or the flowers that are much less full in general of plant toxins. Now, one of the things we know about plant fruit is that uh, it is much less full of toxins when it is ripe and the seeds that it is carrying are ready to be uh, consumed and hopefully pooped out somewhere and not destroyed by chewing. So this is all stuff of previous podcasts. But the point that I'm making here is that by including some of the least toxic plant foods in my diet, specifically fruit, I was able to change the urinary pH and probably the interstitial pH of my body significantly. So hold on a minute. So now you've contradicted yourself, Paul, because you just said that you cannot significantly change the pH of your blood and the fluids of your body. And then you just said that you changed probably your interstitial fluid pH significantly with your diet, as inferred from your urinary pH analysis that changed as a result of consuming probably bicarbonate precursors or something, which will evolve more carbon dioxide out of the solution. Anyway. Wondering about ranges. When I was a strict carnivore, I would often see a urinary pH of five or 5.5. .5. Uh, with the addition of fruit in my diet on a daily basis at this point, uh, my urinary pH is usually between 6.5 and 7.5. Congrats. Who cares? This, I think, is important to consider. And I found it quite interesting that the kids were doing this instinctively. 
And I will say that instinctively... They weren't doing that instinctively. What they were doing was they were going, ooh, salty, fatty meat, yum, yum. And then what they did is they found out that sugar is sweet, or rather fruit is sweet because it has sugar in it. And they said, oh, yeah, that, that tastes really good. Yum, 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 That's what they did, Paul. These children did not select their food to go, hmm, hmm, I think that I need to acidify my body a little more or alkalize it a little more. I've been eating a lot of meat. I need to balance it out with fruit. Okay. There's nothing on our taste buds either that will tell the brain, oh, yeah, let's, let's eat more acid or bases. There is something that feels more balanced, and again, this is completely subjective to me, about in Exactly. It's completely subjective. Some of the least toxic plant foods in your diet. So okay, so you say least toxic plant foods, and instead what you do is you dump a bunch of fruit and honey down your neck because that's apparently the least toxic because it has the least amount, least amount, not a complete absent amount of plant toxins in it in the form of anti-nutrients when there's just an exorbitant amount of sugar in all forms contained within that fruit, okay? And I know you have convinced yourself as well as all of your f ideological fans that the sugar molecules contained within fruit are somehow magically different on a theological basis, on some sort of religious basis or something, than the processed sugar when you extract it from the fruit. It's stupid, it's inane, you know it, whether subconsciously or consciously. All of your fans should know it. It's just ridiculous. By the way, Paul, I adopted your diet for a month because I was like, well, maybe he has a point. And even when I was eating the fruit, I hesitated after every single bite or before every single bite. I really did. And I promise you that I'm telling the truth here. I got used to it but I didn't believe it fully. It made no sense to me, truthfully. I was more easily manipulated back then because I was sick, which is why this pisses me off so much. Anyway, okay, we'll continue now. In the health space may argue that this is a reason to include vegetables. And- Yes, yeah, some people may, and they do in fact, and it just completely exemplifies their ignorance. The perspective of uh, acid-based balance, which I'll get into a little bit more in a moment, potential. Good, please, because you're seven and a half minutes into your 20 minute long video and you haven't talked about it renal acid load, you could make an argument for vegetables. I don't no, you couldn't really, actually, now that I think about it. They make arguments like that, but it doesn't make any rational sense. And also, it's not acid load. It is not an acid load. I think vegetables are the best choice here, again, because they contain more plant toxins, they're more in need of detoxification, and they cause more issues for humans. I think if you want to- So does sugar, Paul. Next. Um, citric acid, which is actually the usual precursor for bicarbonate, which is going to move- No, it's citrate. I'm tired of this whole ick acid versus eight argument. It's eight. That's the suffix. Why? Because when it dissociates into the solution concerned, the pH value of the solution means, given its pKa value of citric acid, that it will exist as citrate in the solution, not citric acid. It's not lactic acid either. It's lactate. Citric acid? No. Citrate. Or urinary pH and probably your interstitial pH to more of the alkaline range, then you can do that with fruit. And I think that's the best way. Why would you want to do that though? Urine has no bearing on one's health, Paul. It doesn't have functions in the body. It is a collection of ammonia-based, well, nitrogen-based compounds and, and other ions to be urinated out. It's separate from the bodily fluids. Evolutionarily consistent way to do that, but this is what I believe and this is sort of what we talk about with an animal. It's what you believe and it's stupid. I, since I mentioned citric acid, I want to make sure you guys understand that this is different than ascorbic acid two completely different molecules. Yes, ascorbic acid or ascorbate is vitamin C. Citric acid is, well, totally different. It is an intermediate in the Krebs cycle, actually, in biochemical terms, I guess. It's also a very prevalent allosteric regulator of enzymatic activity. Acid is uh, the namesake of the citric acid cycle or the TCA cycle. Won't get into all of that crazy biochemistry, today. Crazy biochemistry. Yes, of course we won't get into it because, Paul, you don't understand it. Know that citric acid is a precursor of bicarbonate, which is a, um, a an alkaline type of ion in the human body. And see what you said there, ion. Good. Yeah. Okay. So what you're saying is that if you eat citrate, it's a precursor to forming bicarbonate. Or if you eat citric acid, because it exists as citric acid when you consume it. Fair enough. It'll form citrate, and that will be a precursor to forming bicarbonate. You know what happens when you increase bicarbonate in a solution? The bicarbonate concentration doesn't change. Did you know that, Paul? The H3O plus concentration decreases. Those two react to form carbonic acid, which is volatile and will pop out a carbon dioxide ion, or sorry, molecule, which will be excreted at the lungs according to its concentration gradient at that given instance in time. So yes, bicarbonate is a dependent variable. Why do you want to eat a bunch of things that will alkalize your urine? <sighs> I don't know. H scale, again, it is a logarithmic scale looking at the concentration of hydrogen ions with batteries being... Hydronium. Acidic. 
Stomach acid, as I've talked about in the past, being... You don't have stomach acid, you have stomach acidity. The concentration of HCl in the stomach is at all times necessarily zero. Very acidic in humans, and yet another indication that we are meant to be eating meat. Um, Correct. Good job. Finally got one thing right. Honestly, we should celebrate that, seriously. Vinegar, tomato, blah, 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 blah. Lots of foods on here that I ne wouldn't necessarily include, but just a simple cartoon. Um, <laughs> yet. Where certain things are with... Uh, alkalinity or acidity based on a pH scale. The other thing to note is that general uh, tables, general consideration of which foods are acid and alkaline are kind of a farce. And trying to anticipate which foods are acid and alkaline is needs to be done a little bit more scientifically than most of the shouldn't be done at all because it's unnecessary really i'm serious i mean this really is a problem okay this is a serious problem we need to stop with this it's bread and circuses it's nonsensical there's no need to pay attention to this okay high level articles you will see on the internet if you really want to understand this sort of thing um you might look at an article like this from thomas remmer uh phd potential renal acid load of foods and its influence on urinary pH. If you who this article, you will find that there are some pretty darn complicated calculations looking at various different anions and cations in these foods from which the authors will calculate a prowl a uh, potential renal acid load with Yeah, it's not a renal acid load. negative being more alkaline and positive being more acidic. And what you will find quickly is that most plant foods are on the alkaline side, though not all. Uh, for instance, walnuts um, are apparently, according to this calculation, acidic. And most meats and animal foods will have some acid load. So what we could get not acid load is a balance of plant and animal foods. Uh, you'll notice that um, milk chocolates are uh, acidic, according to this honey is slightly alkaline. And then you'll also notice that many of the grains are. So I think that balancing this can be important. I think that it's interesting that kids do this intrinsically. And they don't do that intrinsically, Paul. That's not what they're doing. You're trying to subserve your theological demands here by twisting it. No evidence of that, Paul. The signal to us that if we are eating intuitively, although I hate that term, from a place of good metabolic health, we may benefit from including some plant foods of the least toxic variety in our diets. It's not least toxic. If anything, they're actually more toxic in my opinion. If you're going to have fruit, have some berries. Just avoid blueberries, I'd say. Now, if you go further down this rabbit hole, what you will find is that there potentially are some benefits to this sort of thing. Here's a paper showing that dietary acid reduction with fruits and vegetables, I would just favor the fruits, or bicarbonate. Of course you would. As a supplement, attenuates kidney injury in patients with a moderately reduced glomerular filtration rate due to hypertensive nephropathy. So when people with uh, progressive kidney disease due to hypertension that has injured their kidneys, including more of these alkaline foods is beneficial. One of the things I- No, beneficial is a cause and effect statement. Stop talking with such conviction. Stop saying cause and effect terms. It's ridiculous. Stop saying risk. Stop saying attenuates. Stop doing all of it, okay? Human beings want to continue using these words to describe inferential statistics that is only observational and honestly unsophisticated and vapid observations, desperate, weightless observations, because we like to establish order in the universe as much as possible, even at the expense of responsibility. It's stupid. It needs to to stop. Science is ambiguous. It cannot establish cause and effect hardly ever, especially in this sphere. In this sphere, it can never show cause and effect. It never will. It never has. And we're going to have to deal with that. You need to understand that. Now, all of you commentators need to stop saying risk increases your risk of this by blank percent. Also, stop using relative outcome statistics. It's misleading. Okay? Use absolute outcome statistics. Stop saying attenuates. Stop it. About an animal-based diet is that the amount of protein that I would recommend or that I think is evolutionarily consistent, may be difficult for people to tolerate who have already developed kidney disease and they may need to. Yes, that is where the myth comes from. The animal protein causes kidney damage. It's because if you feed someone with already existing kidney disease or kidney damage, amino acids, which have sulfur, they contain sulfur. What's gonna happen? The amount of protein with increased carbohydrates, but 
Nevertheless, I think it is interesting to note that um, potentially thinking about this, if you have a kidney injury, may be beneficial. The other thing to note is that there isn't a whole lot of pure bicarbonate in plant food. As I mentioned earlier, it's mostly citric acid that gets converted to bicarbonate in your body. Some people have record cool. drinking very bicarbonate-rich waters like Gerald Steiner. Uh, yeah, or like Dr. James DiNicolantonio, a coward who deletes comments off of his videos that in many cases are actually extremely anodyne and objective and are simply coming at him from a well-intentioned point of view. Yeah, Dr. James, yeah, mm -hmm. he gets most of his money from that stuff. So, of course, he'll never let that go. Anyway, continue, Paul. Huge fan of this because, as you can imagine, if you dump a bunch of bicarbonate directly into your stomach, you can affect the stomach pH negatively. That is, make it more alkaline which will make it more temporarily for you to digest your food. This is a correct problem if you're just eating things like baking soda, which will alkalinize your urine and create some sort of an alkaline uh, balance to the foods you're eating. But it is also going to essentially abrogate any acidity in your stomach, which is not something I am a huge fan of either. Um, there's another article I wanted to point out here where they are estimating the uh, renal net acid excretion by adults consuming variable amounts of protein. This is another paper looking at pretty complex formulas just to show you that it's not as simple as just saying, hey, this foods are acidic and this foods alkaline. Uh, they have to look at all of the minerals and uh, the metabolites of these and get a sense of how these may affect the uh, acid versus alkaline balance in the body, which is very tightly orchestrated and buffered and is an exquisite uh, illustration of millions of years of let's just say mammalian biology, something to be marveled at, really. Oh, I'm sorry, hold on a minute. You said it was because of millions of years of mammalian biology, implying that it was evolution. It's not evolution, Paul, not really. Evolution didn't cause that. It's a basic law of physics, pH balance. We evolved around the already existing law. That's what it was. It's not like our bodies evolved to do exactly what it did. If we didn't evolve around the already existing law, we would have spontaneously combusted on multiple occasions because we would have failed to meet the law of electroneutrality. The other thing that I want to be very clear to point out is that um, there are no really good studies that show that higher protein diets are negative for bone mineral density. In fact, if you look at the protein consumption and bone mineral density in the elderly, the Rancho Bernardo study from um, Joanne uh, Promislow, this is published in 2002 in the American Journal of Epidemiology, what you'll find, this is an observational study, but the study supports a protective role for dietary animal protein in the skeletal health of elderly women. And conversely, there is a negative association between vegetable protein uh, and bone mineral, bone mineral density in both sexes. These are- That doesn't surprise me. They're just associations first and foremost. This has just as much veracity as all the other studies that you put up on the screen here, but we do know what bones are made of and that it requires bioavailable protein. And we know that the bioavailability of things like broccoli and soy protein are actually extremely low as inferred by measuring the nitrogen containing catabolic byproducts present in urine and fecal matter as compared to the amount of nitrogen consumed as protein within that same time period. So. We cannot draw causative inference here, but we can generate. Right. So, okay. So you want to, you want to say that. And then on the other one, you said, oh, it attenuates this. It improves this. What is that? That's a cause and effect claim. Compelling hypotheses. I think that bone mineral. No, not compelling. Compelling means you have no choice, but to adopt that opinion. The is about many things. One of them being adequate amounts of protein in the human diet. And if you really look at the entirety of human physiology literature, adequate protein in the diet or even high protein quote unquote diets are generally associated are almost unequivocally associated with a better bone density. I think some of the concerns. Sure. And it's my opinion that that has a causative relationship, at least plays a causative role, but that's my opinion. Expressed by people in the scientific literature are that a high protein diet is going to be too acidic and it's going to leach minerals out of your bones. Leading yeah, to it's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. Dr. James DiNicolantonio says this. It's stupid, it's desperate, and usually it's promulgated from vegan folks. Lower mineral density or osteoporosis. And that is not borne out in the research. I think in contradistinction, we can point out that getting an adequate, I would say a robust amount of protein provides building blocks for collagen and many of the minerals that are needed to make strong, healthy bone. So what does this have to do with acid-base balance, really? I think a high-protein diet, what I would recommend is one gram of protein per pound of gold body weight is a safe place and will provide 
plenty of building blocks to make. It can be up to 1.5 times that amount given your training status and or frequency. Bone. That is in the context of thinking about your urinary pH and benefiting from some of the alkaline minerals and the citric acid found in fruits in this equation or in this specific instance. So this is just theology and you're desperately trying to find other reasons why you should add fruit and honey into a diet that does not require fruit nor honey. What a shock. So Paul, what does this mean? What are you telling us? Basically, Good question, Paul. I'm mentioning or I'm pointing out that Number one, kids self-selecting their diets do balance acid and alkaline elements. So what? Also 50-50, exactly? On a carnivore diet, if you are strict and you do not include fruit, uh, you are going to have a much more negative urinary pH and probably- No, there's no such thing as a negative urinary pH in both definitions. A negative value, like negative blank, and also negative as in a value judgment statement. How can you have a negative urinary pH when it has no effect on your physiology, Paul? It's so silly and desperate. Come on, Paul. And also to say that you are going to have one. Didn't you say in your four year ago video, the one that I just reacted to two weeks ago, that you can balance your urinary pH on a carnivore? diet by consuming more calcium <laughs> more negative uh or excuse me a more acidic urinary ph and a more acidic interstitial fluid between your cells who care also no not necessarily interstitial fluids we already covered that may not be a great thing for humans and i suspect that uh, paul covered the urine thing and we covered all of the other aqueous solutions in the body and how their ph is tightly regulated based upon homeostatic mechanisms adding some citric acid and other alkalinizing minerals found in fruit may actually be another benefit of an animal-based diet. There are no benefits of what you term and deem to be an animal-based diet at all. And I'm going to go that far to say, I'm going to say that there are no benefits, none. If anything, that is actually worse in ways, at least, than doing a plant-based keto diet for many people. Because you mixing fatty acids and carbohydrates together, glucose particularly, but also eating all the fructose as well and all the sorbitol that results from the hyperglycemic situations, causing cell bursting to occur, is causing immense amount of inflammation in your body and to other people as well, Paul. You're just telling people to eat the standard American diet. It's just dressed up. Um, so I wanted to point all those things out, show you how these things are actually calculated with a potential renal acid load. Uh, recommend that if you're curious about this, you just go to whatever purveyor you would like and buy some urinary acid uh, pH strips. Why would you do that? We already covered that, didn't we? And check your urinary pH after different foods, after different meals. No need to do that either. So this is basically the same thing as the last video I did on them. Good stuff on waking throughout the day and get a sense of it, my recommendation would be something between 6.5 and 7.5. Well, who cares what your recommendation is, Paul? Because you don't know science. You don't understand chemistry. You don't understand biochemistry. You don't understand inferential statistics. You don't understand cancer biology even. You don't understand the basic rudimentary levels of science. Not one bit, not at all. Probably ideal, much below 6.5. Um, you're probably not getting enough of the alkaline elements, which can be beneficial from this perspective. So hopefully- No, may be, not can be. It's helpful. I also want to- It's not helpful. Oh, myths about alkalinity. Yeah, let's, let's, let's dispel myths, Paul, about alkalinity. Cancer, uh, this is not supported by science that I've seen. I don't think that alkaline water is a great thing. I don't think it's something you want to be pushing too much in your body. I think your water should be a normal water pH, which is usually around 7.0. No, it's not. It's normally around 6.8, actually, Paul, because as soon as you expose it to the atmosphere, carbon dioxide is dissolved into it to form carbonic acid to then form H3O plus and HCO3 minus, which lowers the pH. And I should also mention that it is possible to become too alkaline, which can be very uh, problematic for you as a human. Yes. And yet another reason I don't think we should be drinking a bunch of alkaline water. Well, that's also not going to make you more alkaline, Paul. Or rather, it's not going to make you too... You're not going to get into alkalosis by drinking alkaline water. See, now, now you've also overstepped your boundaries again. You've got it wrong again, Paul. That's not possible. One thing I do think we should be doing is getting organs in our diets. I've spoken about this widely. This is why we do what we do at Heart and Soil. Speaking... You don't need organs in your diet, nor do you really want to consume them. If you want to, then go ahead. Stay away from liver. Out. Bone mineral density and acid and alkaline minerals makes me think of our bone matrix supplement, which is microcrystalline hydroxyapatite. Okay, so here we go. Yeah, hydroxyapatite, that's an important bone mineral and teeth mineral as well. So what? So here, here's your plug. 
This is a fantastic way for humans to get very high quality calcium. And you also get sufficient calcium from muscle meat. Have you noticed that I only sell supplements that actually do good things? And by supplements, I mean one brand. Did you know that, Paul? It's one brand. And it's also not a nutritional supplement because the carnivore diet isn't lacking in anything. You know, in, instead of selling those supplements, why don't you just tell people to eat organs and that's it? All the other minerals that are needed to create healthy bones and in the setting of an adequate protein diet, I think this can be a very valuable uh, supplement. It's something that I recommend strongly to my mom who has osteoporosis. I also Do you also recommend that she consumes a bunch of fruit and honey? Because that's a problem. Now we're getting into contentious territory. I'm not denigrating or disparaging his mother. She has no business in this at all. Want to share with you guys a, a review we got recently on histamine and immune, which was really striking. The title. All right, we're done. So this is just his advertisement. This is his plug after saying a bunch of nonsense and also irrelevant information that has no actual importance whatsoever. This sounds a lot like Paul. I'm familiar with it. But if you saw me extremely apathetic and insouciant, well, there's your there's your reason. It's because it's the same old stuff. The banality with Paul is immense. So anyway, with that being said, please, if you liked the video, subscribe and leave a like and leave your thoughts in the comment section below. And also, once again, subscribe to the Patreon if you haven't already and buy my book Contraindicated if you have already. And also, most importantly, I just recently mentioned this link at the bottom of the screen. What is that link? That is a link that will bring you to an amazing site with amazing products from an amazing brand known as Cerule. If you purchase product through that link, you will get a permanent 10% discount and also a permanent free shipping discount when signing up for monthly deliveries. And also, if you email me at edgoki14 at gmail.com, behind the scenes, I can tell you how to earn those products for free because who in their right mind wouldn't want that? So, of course, before buying anything, I would recommend you learn about them first. So, I would refer to the link in the top right corner of the screen, the Cerule products link, which is a complete video elucidation and explanation of what those products are, who should take them, why you should take them, when to take them, etc, etc. And I would also migrate further to the description below to find a video between myself and Professor Bart K on these products in further detail, as well as the company of Cerule itself, which I think is extremely important, so you know where your money is going. Also, if you're someone that would not like to donate recurring payments in the form of a Patreon subscription or a Cerule auto ship or monthly shipment, I have made available a donation link from GoFundMe in the description below. If you would like to submit or donate one-time donations as opposed to recurring ones. And finally, once again, email me at goki14 at gmail.com if you have any questions regarding anything at all. So with that being said, join me next time when someone else talks our ear off about nothing at all. That being Paul Saladino, most likely. So till then.